What is going on world? What's up YouTube? It's Zero here. Today I'm bringing you guys a brand new episode of the 8 Below Show. Welcome everyone to 8 Below. Thanks for being here guys to the best entertainment related show here on YouTube. And I'm super excited about our episode here today. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. So let's get into it. The Call of Duty League playoffs have been something pretty special, guys. COD Champs 2020 is obviously going to be one for the books, in my personal opinion. I think this might be one of the best we've ever seen. Just because now, guys, with the city-based teams and the format of the Call of Duty League, on top of the trophy to the different you know personalities that are playing in these games, to now where we are as far as from a perspective of, you know, everything that we know at this very point in time as to where we are and what we can maybe expect, you know, as this uh, as the playoffs continue and we get closer and closer to crowning a champion. So I want to talk about the Call of Duty League as far as from the playoffs, uh, in, you know, and COD Champs just as a whole. You can kind of break down some of these games, guys, and I would love to hear your thoughts about some of these games and your thoughts just about the Call of Duty League and COD Champs at this point in time in the comment section down below. So let's get into it. So, uh, guys, where we stand at this very moment in time, we have... Uh, the, in the winner's finals, you got Atlanta phase versus Dallas empire. And then elimination round five, which is the Chicago Huntsman versus the London Royal Ravens. Now, in order to get some context on where we are at this very moment in time, we got to go back and look at kind of where we came from. And you know, guys, honestly, my bracket was actually doing pretty good for a little while, but I'm not going to lie. The place where I was very wrong was uh, I predicted that Optic Gaming was going to be the dar a Dark Horse team, but I did not expect what was to come from the London Royal Ravens. That is a team, guys, that has really surprised me here at COD Champs. I had them actually losing to the Toronto Ultra in the winner's round one, and then being knocked down to the elimination round two, and losing to the Paris Legion. I thought Paris Legion were going to win. I thought... That the Royal Ravens were going to give them a tough time, but I did not expect that. I certainly would not have predicted London Royal Ravens beating the Subliners, and I would not have had the Royal Ravens beating the Toronto Ultra in a rematch in the elimination round four. Now, the Royal Ravens are on a, a really nice run. And uh, like I said, to give you guys some context here, uh, obviously Optic Gaming guys was definitely a dark horse team, and it was just fitting that Optic uh, lost to the Chicago Huntsmen, you know. I thought that, that was like a really fitting end to Optic Gaming's uh, run at COD Champs. And here's what I'm going to say, though, is that, you know, Optic Gaming, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with, in my personal opinion, at some moment, uh, you know, down the road here, depending on what happens, of course, in the offseason. The Chicago Huntsman guys uh, lost to FaZe, Atlanta FaZe, 3-2, to two, and so that was a very close matchup. Dallas Empire beating the Toronto Ultra 3-2, to two, so that was a really close one as well. Uh... A lot of this is pretty much what I, I definitely could see. The only thing that I was not expecting was the Royal Ravens making it to the elimination round five. Did not see that coming whatsoever. But obviously, Atlanta Phase versus Dallas Empire in the winner's finals, I absolutely thought that was going to happen. Um, I would say at this point in time, guys, that the Chicago Huntsmen are going to beat the Royal Ravens. Maybe it's going to be pretty close. It might go the distance. But I think the Huntsmen will move on to the elimination finals. I believe that FaZe is going to beat the Dallas Empire, which was, uh, FaZe is um, the team I believe is going to win it all, but I have FaZe beating Dallas Empire, they go to the championship, and then you got Dallas Empire versus Chicago Huntsman, which is going to be another E Classico, uh, you know, of course, from like the Envy and Optic days, um, and I, I do have actually the Empire winning that. I know there's going to be a ton of eyeballs on that matchup, and I think a lot of people are going to think the Huntsman will win. But I, I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to say, guys. I mean, both teams are are are, are going to be, you know, pretty evenly matched. But I just don't, I, I don't see the Huntsman beating the Empire, even though it could obviously happen. I mean, anything can happen. I mean, that is what we found out from this entire first, you know, season of the COD League is that anybody can win any given weekend when we're talking about the home series to, to now, guys. I mean, the London Royal Ravens are on a tear right now, which is unbelievable. I mean, who knows? They could win it all. It's a hard thing. But I do have the Empire and the Huntsman playing in the elimination finals, and I do have the Dallas Empire winning that one. 
going on moving uh, to play against FaZe once again, and the Empire once again lose to FaZe. Now, obviously, guys, you know, the Empire could beat FaZe, go to the championship, and then FaZe plays the Huntsman or the Royal Ravens. I mean, there's so many different ways that it could turn out, but that's what I'm predicting, and I'm saying that FaZe are going to win it all. I just think at the end of the day, even though, um, you know, the big thing about FaZe is that they are a young team as well. In my personal opinion, I think that FaZe actually has the highest ceiling in the COD League at this point, just because of, you know, even though they don't have a lot of championship experience like the Huntsman and the Empire do, they have the, you know, this is all going to be a great experience for them moving forward. And I think that moving forward, they're going to have a really good run um, at some point or another in future years. But that's what I got, guys, and I think it's been something really special up to this point, that being Kai Champs in the playoffs at this point in time, especially Optic Gaming versus Chicago Huntsman, which was absolutely, that was that was massive. I mean, that was such a great narrative and kind of a, uh, you know, who knows how many more times that we're going to be seeing that matchup in future years with like Scumpy and the other guys who used to be on Optic. You know, it's a very interesting ordeal, but... Um, you know, it, it's cool to see that the, the Huntsmen were able to overcome that, you know, because who knows if they would have lost to Optic and got knocked out from Optic, that would have been, I mean, the narratives and the talk, uh, and all of that around that matchup would be talked about for a long time to come, um, that the old team maybe put Scumpy in retirement or, you know, things of that nature, who knows what kind of narratives would have spun from that. But we don't get that. We get Chicago Huntsman moving on to the elimination round five against the London Royal Ravens. Exciting stuff, guys. Let me know what you think about it so far. I'll obviously, keep you guys updated as we get further and further into the bracket and uh, when we crown a champion. Let me know what you guys think. And for more Call of Duty League content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. We've talked on the YouTube channel about Rage and this franchise that I personally really enjoy overall, but I've seen in the past, guys, there's a number of ways I believe that Rage could become a better, you know, franchise overall, different ways that we can uh, have uh, to connect with this franchise moving forward if the developers decide to go ahead in that direction and kind of add more for us to do in Rage 3. And so that's why I want to talk about in this segment of the show is everything that we want out of this game, and obviously it hasn't been announced, uh, you know, confirmed at this point in time. We're hoping and speculating that a Rage 3 will come at some point or another, but uh, when I say we guys, I mean, let me give you guys my thoughts and opinions here. I would love to hear yours though in the comment section down below about the things that you want to see in Rage 3, so let's get into it. So for us to kind of predict and hope for certain things to change in the future of the Rage franchise, we got to look at like the present and the past of where this franchise has gone. So what we know, guys, it, most recently in our minds is Rage 2. And right off the bat, with this game in particular, the developers were already talking about Rage 3 before Rage 2 had even come out, which was a very kind of a red flag in my personal opinion that they were already looking forward to the to the next game before actually really focusing on Rage 2. Now, don't get me wrong, I liked Rage 2 quite a bit. Uh, I thought that there were certain things though that certainly needed, you know, kind of changed or things that, you know, kind of needed to be more elaborated on in this in this project. So with that, the number one thing for me guys that I want to see in Rage 3 is a full package, obviously. This was something that we did not get with Rage 2. And when I talk about a full package, guys, I mean a single-player campaign, co-op modes, and multiplayer. I think having a full package brings you back to the game after you're done beating, say, the single-player campaign, which is all that Rage 2 had um, to really, you know, be able to connect with this franchise or th this game in particular was a single player story. And I'm not saying that the story wasn't good, but what I'm, what I'm getting at here is after you're done beating the campaign, you ended up, you know, probably maybe playing it one more time over, maybe a couple of times over to look for collectibles and things of that nature. But then most of us are going to just move on to other games if there isn't other things to do in this world, like co-op missions, doing 
multiplayer from a PvE perspective, like you're playing with your friends, going up against waves and waves of enemies, or just playing PvP against other people, which I believe that Rage is a prime game, a game that definitely could uh, kind of offer PvP modes and even PvE modes at the same time. So I think the big thing for me is having a full package. That's number one. Number two is absolutely, guys, you know, having things to do along the journey is really important when you're talking about a single-player campaign. So, say they bring a single-player campaign to Rage 3, which I think we would all anticipate and expect at this point, but I, I remember, you know, during Rage 2 and that game in particular, we are, you know, as you're traveling... The, you know, the wasteland itself, there's not much out there, you know, and not a lot of things to do and such, which I know they were giving us that kind of that feel, that vibe that this is a wasteland for a reason. But I think having more things to do along the journey, whether you're talking side missions, um, having like different ways in which you can find different collectibles and, and, and Easter eggs and all of those different things, guys, having more things to do along the journey is, in my opinion, a great way to continue connecting and learning more about the game and the franchise that we're in. And so uh, for Rage 3, the open world scenario is great. But I think having it where there's a variety of environments and a variety of different locations and such, sure, having wastelands and all of that is fine, but also having, you know, a variety and then having more things that you can do along the journey. So if you're going to have another single player campaign in Rage 3 and that's all the game's going to encompass is a campaign uh, I really want there to be a ton of different things to do, but I would prefer a ton of things to do inside of that world, have a great story, and then on top of that, having multiplayer and co-op modes, which leads me to the next thing is, you know, when we look at the Rage franchise at this very moment in time, you know, I, I kind of, I feel that not only were there a number of, of bugs and issues that kind of came up in Rage 2, and it seemed like some of those things were fixed, some of them took a while to get fixed. I just really want there to be this emphasis on, you know, from Avalanche Studios, ID Software, and then of course, you know, Bethesda as the publisher, to really be on those things on a consistent basis to kind of give us that, that you know, that best kind of scenario and, and experience that we possibly can get, you know. Uh, overall, you know, I'd love to even have a longer campaign, a longer, you know, uh, like I said, a longer journey. That is Rage 3. I think that would be really great as well. Learning more and more, like I said, about this franchise, because then you become more invested. Having new characters, new enemies, like we already talked about, new locations, new environments, new weaponry that you can utilize, new uh, vehicles to be able to traverse the world in a number of ways is all very important. Having familiarities, guys, or, you know, similarities is really important as well. Things that, you know, you look and you're like, yeah, that's that's definitely within the Rage universe. But then having those differences is really important as well. And so with Rage 3, I definitely want there to be some similarities, but obviously some differences as well. And I would say I'd like to have more differences than similarities because if you get more differences, that obviously means that you're probably going to be getting things like co-op, like having multiplayer modes, which are going to bring you back to the experience of over and over again. And I talk at nauseam about that, guys, but there's so many games out there that are triple A games that don't do that, and they expect us as as gamers and consumers to pay a $60 to pay the $60 price tag for a product that only has a single player campaign. And I'm not saying that Rage 2 is not worth it, but at the end of the day, after you're done beating that story, uh, there's no other way to comp you know connect with that that game in particular unless you go on the, you know, Reddit or you know, you're connecting through the community in other ways, but I'm saying from a pure experience, there needs to be more ways to to connect with it in my personal opinion. But with that, guys, those are the things overall for me. One, you know, uh, other thing that I would put into the honorable mentions is having free to play elements 
to Rage 3. So what I'm getting at here is, is having, you know, some modes in the, in, from a multiplayer perspective that are free to play. And the reason why I say free to play is because, you know, you look at all these AAA titles that are out there now, and there's a lot of games out there that are having elements or they're fully free to play. And so I look at a game like Call of Duty, where you have Call of Duty, uh, Modern Warfare came out, and then the Battle Royale version, that being Call of Duty Warzone, was 100% free to play. What it does, guys, is not only does it get more people to play the game and at least try it to see what it's all about, but then some of those people are going to buy the full version because they want to play the campaign. They want to play, you know, co-op modes. They want to play, you know, on the other multiplayer maps and such and see what else it offers. That's why a full package is so important, in my opinion, especially for a AAA game that is being published by Bethesda, which is one of the biggest, you know, publishers out there. So, Rage 3, guys, I would love to see, like I said, have some free-to-play elements to it. I'm not saying the whole game being free, but I'm saying, just for example, if Rage 3 decided to do kind of like a Battle Royale mode, which might be interesting in the Wasteland, or they decided to have some PvP, you know, modes or PvE modes that were free-to-play, it's at least going to get people to try it, and then that builds the fan base over time. And so that's something that I think is really going to be important moving into this title. But with that being said... This is One Man's Thoughts. I want to hear yours in the comment section down below. What do you guys think and what would you want to see in Rage 3? Let me know. And for more Rage 3 content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. With Halo Infinite being delayed at this point in time, guys, to 2021, I wanted to talk about all of the things that we know at this point in time about the title. We're sure going to be finding out more things as we get closer to the official release date. But with that, guys, I wanted to talk about everything that we know now about Halo Infinite. We can kind of give our opinions, and I'd love to hear yours in the comment section down below. So let's get into it. So in an article, guys, written by Wes Fenlon and Fraser Brown of PC Gamer, everything we know about Halo Infinite, which is Halo 6 is officially Halo Infinite. It's coming to PC. Despite ditching the number, Halo Infinite is the next step in Master Chief's story and the conclusion of 343's new trilogy. It's been confirmed for both Windows 10 and Xbox as Halo the Master Chief Collection continues to roll out on PC in 2020. Microsoft followed up our first brief look at Halo Infinite E3 2018 with a new, with a longer trailer the following year and a gameplay reveal in the summer of 2020. Now, what is the Halo Infinite release date? Halo Infinite will release sometime in 2021. It was originally planned as a launch title for the Xbox Series X with a launch window during the 2020 holidays. Since then, 343 Industries have announced a delay to, to next year to ensure the team has adequate time to deliver a Halo game experience that meets our vision. And so, I think a lot of it has to do with, guys, the, the delay at least, has to do a lot with the simple fact of the matter that there was a lot of backlash based around the graphics and especially like the character graphics, some of the environmental graphics from what we saw this summer at the Xbox Game Showcase. And I think with good reason, I mean, to me, guys, um, you know, obviously the, the the graphics to me, there were certain elements of it that did look really good in my opinion. Um, other things, not so much. Like the character graphics, I didn't like. I did not like, there didn't seem like there was much variety of new uh, characters, like enemies and such. It didn't, it didn't seem like it was the same. It was like, you know, grunts and jackals and brutes. It was all basically the same. It's not, they didn't look at, they've evolved much. Like when I think of evolution of like an Xbox game, like exclusive, I think about Gears of War. Gears of War has consistently added new enemies to go up against, even new characters that are, you know, side characters and such that are, you know, new cogs and then, of course, like new enemies. And so overall, Gears of War has done a really good job with that. Halo, for some reason, has not really added much uh, to their lineup of enemies. Now, maybe we're kind of, you know, from the outside looking in, guys, obviously, we're not going to know until the full game is out. I like certain things, certainly about Halo Infinite. I'm excited about the title, but there, I think that it was smart for them to delay the release, even though it's going to hurt Xbox a lot, in my opinion. So, some of the fast facts about Halo Infinite. Forge Mode is back. Uh, is there a Halo ring? Absolutely. Microtransactions, maybe, but no loot boxes. Battle Royale Mode. 343 Industries has said it isn't planning one. Now, I don't know if that's 100% confirmed or not, 
there's been a lot of talk in the community that Battle Royale will be in, um, uh, will be in Halo Infinite, which I think would be actually pretty cool, having a BR mode that, you know, they can incorporate Forge, mo uh, Forge mode into the BR would be something really special, how they could maybe do something like that. Uh, the microtransactions, guys, I think we can all expect that they're going to have some form or another of, uh, of microtransactions, but yeah, obviously I don't think loot boxes are going to be something that, that ends up happening, but we, uh, as far as uh, the gameplay for Halo Infinite. We got our first look at Halo Infinite in action in a gameplay reveal during Microsoft's Xbox Game Showcase for July 2020. There's quite a bit to catch there, uh, from the ban banished brute faction to the new grappling hook to the more open world looking objective map for Infinite. And what I'll say guys, is the grappling hook, a lot of people don't like that. I think that's an interesting concept, and we'll have to see how that really plays out once we kind of get our hands on it. As far as the open world, I'm really excited about that. Even though I was really skeptical about Gears of War going to a semi-open world when it's normally just a linear experience, Halo being a linear experience to now a full open world, it seems, or at least a semi-open world, I, I I feel a lot better about it now after Gears 5 came out uh, with that semi-open world feel. It, it really helps you connect more with the environments and kind of traverse where we've had you know, a bunch of Halo games in the past, and they all have this linear experience, so this will be a nice change, I think. Um, as far as Halo Infinite's release was almost split into campaign and multiplayer. In a recent interview on the Animal Talking talk show, uh, Xbox boss Phil Spencer explained that Halo Infinite's release was almost split into two dates, one for the campaign and one for multiplayer. He said that ultimately a divided release didn't feel to all of us like the Halo release that we would want. Instead of the split, Microsoft decided to delay the game into 2021, news that hit fans hard considering Infinite was poised to be the marquee launch game of the Xbox Series X. Now, what I'll say about that, guys, is one, another huge thing for Halo, and this could be really big, is that the multiplayer they're talking is going to be free to play. Um, so I think that they're going to get a lot of people, at least initially, to try the game out. And I think that's going to be great for Halo. Having free to play elements, guys, uh, more and more is happening in a lot of these games, especially big AAA titles. And so I think that's a really smart move here to have at least some form of, of free to play. And uh, having multiplayer do that, it could really help Halo in a major way. Now, Halo Infinite has a more open world. As seen in the gameplay reveal, Halo Infinite will have a more open world than past Halo games. The section we got a look at was several hours into the game, at which point it sounds like Master Chief can tackle various objectives, though 343 says there's still definitely a linear story to follow. What you saw in the demo that we showed, you have this map. There's this huge open section of the ring. As you get to that point in the game, th uh, this is several hours in the campaign. Then you have the ability to traverse that whole area and explore where you want to go on the ring. Studio head Chris Lee told IGN. And so that's a really interesting ordeal, guys, is that, you know, obviously... There's, it seems like it's going to be one of those things like here's your objective, but here's a number of other things that you can do before going to the objective or, you know, between missions or something. I really like that concept. It's really cool. It's, I just, one, one thing I don't like guys is when they force you to do those side missions in order to get to the next objective or the next main mission. Similar to games like what Ubisoft has done with like some of the Assassin's Creed titles, more, the more recent ones, and even Far Cry 5. I, I don't like where it feels like you have to do side missions and things of that nature in order to move on in the main story because it kind of takes you out of the main story especially when you're starting to get invested in it in it i love doing the side missions though at my own pace and so i hope they do that here with halo infinite now uh like we already said guys halo infinite multiplayer will be free to play halo is for everyone we can confirm halo infinite multiplayer will be free to play and will support 120 frames per second on xbox series x uh, more deals, details will be shared later. That's huge news with more and more of the most popular multiplayer games going free to play. Making Halo Infinite's multiplayer free from the get-go is a very savvy move from Xbox. Of course, any member of the increasingly great X, uh, Game Pass service will get the full game anyway, which is really great as well. Xbox Game Pass, best service in all of gaming, and it's not even close. Will Master Chief be the star of Halo Infinite? Another yes, of course, guys. We don't know much about the story, but yes, Master Chief is the protagonist. Halo Infinite is set after the events of Halo 5. It is the next chapter in the uh, Big Green Soldiers saga. Now, what I'll say about this, guys, is that I think they obviously... I, I think 343, they learned 
what they did right, what they did wrong, and what they could do better from Halo 5 to now. And having Master Chief as the focal point, I think, is a really good move. My question, though, is, is this the last go-around for Master Chief? Is he going to pass the torch on to another character at some point or another? There's been talk that this is going to be... You know, this game, this Halo game, Halo Infinite, they're planning on making this the title for the next, like, 10 years of Halo, not necessarily planning on making other, you know, Halo games in between that. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, something interesting that they're planning on just servicing this game consistently. Maybe they don't want to move on from Master Chief anytime soon. Um, I wonder if this is going to be the conclusion of Master Chief's story, though. Uh, that will be interesting. The end of Halo 5 seemingly sets up a rampant Cortana as the villain of this next game. And years ago, 343 talked about Halo 4 as the start of a new Reclaimer trilogy that will presumably cover Halo Infinite. The story of Halo Wars 2 will also have some impact on the events of Halo Infinite. Though it's unknown if there will be any real character crossover between the two. Halo 5's legendary ending also gives away that another Halo Ring installation will come into play next time around. And then, of course, the Banished are back as Halo Infinite's enemies. Our first scene at the Banished come, uh, came in a transmission video published by 343 Industries. Includes an audio message from the rebellious faction of brute mercenaries from Halo Wars 2. And uh, obviously there was a, a transcript, a, a message and such. But what about Cortana, though? Twitter user Expel uh, noticed something from the E3 2019 trailer, a series of red flashes in Master Chief's visor that, when spliced together, form a QR code. The code led them to this audio clip. At the end of the clip, we hear Cortana say, This, this is part of me. I don't know why, I don't know how, but it is me. Rogue Cortana may yet play into the plot, though that may be uh, a reveal 343 are looking to save for launch. And then Halo Infinite is the platform the next 10 years of Halo, like I had already mentioned, guys. We want Infinite to grow over time versus going to those numbered titles and having all that segmentation that we had before. Halo Infinite Studio had Chris Lee send an interview with IGN. It's really about creating Halo Infinite as the start of the next gen, uh, the next 10 years for Halo, and then building that as we go with our fans and community. Now, look, there's pros and cons to this. The pros are, guys, is that, yeah, you get this Halo title, and then it's this is going to be the title for the next 10 years. Things, obviously, are subject to change, though. I mean, we've seen this in tons of different games that say, oh, yeah, 10-year plan, and then ends up being like a three-, five-year plan. I'm hoping they can stick to it, but from just looking at, you know, the backlash that came from the Halo Infinite reveal, I've got to say, guys, that... I wouldn't be surprised if this is more of a five-year plan and then they be, get another, make another Halo game. I think a lot of it depends on, you know, the types of money that it's churning out from, you know, Xbox Game Pass to the microtransactions in the game to uh, how many people are playing the multiplayer experience. You know, obviously them delaying the game is a good thing because you want this to be a, a finalized, polished product. But uh, also, you know, that kind of leads us to think that maybe, just maybe, they are going to, um, you know, there's going to be problems even at launch. And so I don't know if the 10-year plan is, you know, don't take that with a pinch of salt. Let's, let's put it that way. And um, as far as, you know, some of the new weapons that are in Halo, guys, uh, we have... Uh, the Ravager, which is a banished three-round burst energy weapon that runs on plasma fuel. The Mangler is a banished pistol with giant kinetic projectiles that fires more slowly than the UNSC pistol, but deals more damage. Then the Bulldog, the new UNSC riot shotgun that replaces the classic shotgun. And then the Commando, this UNSC rifle can go full auto and is good for mid-long range. And then you got the Pulse Carbon, a familiar but not quite an identical version of the classic Covenant carbine weapon. What I will say, guys, is earlier when I said that I didn't like that there was no variety in characters, really, uh, as far as like from the Covenant perspective... Um, you know, something that we do need to mention is that they do have new weapons, and that's something that Halo does do. They do different weapons, but the enemies, there's not very much enemy changes or add-ons and such, uh, which is really unfortunate, but I'm excited about the new weapons, at least what, we see, what we've see, seen so far. That leads me to think that there's going to be other weapons that come into the fray uh, along the journey. 
And so, um, as far as the Halo Infinite multiplayer, guys, obviously Halo Infinite will feature multiplayer, but specifics remain sparse. There will be f local four-player split-screen multiplayer, a recent uh, stream confirmed, as well as Spartan customization based on Halo Reach. Um, apparently, what it won't have, 3 for 3 insists, is a Battle Royale mode. I'll tell you right now, the only BR we're really interested in is Battle Rifle. 3 for 3 Industries lead writer uh, Jeff Easterling said in response to a question about the mode's possible inclusion, the original BR, so calm yourself, but who knows what could happen. Fortnite's pretty influential. More recently, 343 head Bonnie Ross gave a broader answer. Whatever we do needs to be the right thing for Halo. Whether or not you call it a battle royale or how we're thinking about things going forward, the team thinks about this needs to be right for Halo. So that's not a definite no. It seems like Infinite won't be blindly following the trend, but could eventually put its own spin on a last man standing mode. And that's certainly something that I could, I could totally see at some point. I, I just think that... Uh, for Halo, at least, being like the ODST, um, you know, you kind of drop down and, uh, you know, I could totally see BR being something really awesome, especially if you can traverse the world by using Forge mode in the BR. I think that could be uh, really cool. Speaking of Forge mode, will Forge mode return? Forge is back in Halo Infinite. This time, Forge is being mainly developed by co-developer Skybox Labs, the studio behind Halo 5's PC map making tool Halo 5 Forge. Skybox also handled the Xbox One X enhancement f enhancements for Halo 5, so it's clear they know their way around a Master Chief. With every new iteration of Forge, its capabilities grow enormously. From what we can sell, Halo Infinite will be no exception. With regards to a rumored Battle Royale mode, director Frank O'Connor said, it's not included in Infinite, but you can probably make your own Battle Royale mode in Forge even right now. And I think that that's another way that you could see the community put a BR together. Will Halo Infinite have microtransactions? Halo Infinite might have microtransactions, but it won't have loot boxes. A job listing for an online experience design director included in the list of responsibilities overseeing design and implementation of things like microtransactions. It's not clear what uh, what for Halo's microtransactions will take, but 3 for 3's Chris Lee confirmed it wouldn't include loot boxes and then guys there probably i would assume there will be a beta at some point or another um halo infinite remains on track even though because even though with everything going on with the pandemic um look at the end of the day guys i am excited about this about this game uh probably you know um i I'm just glad Halo's coming back. Let's put it that way. I, I'm really glad that it's coming back. It needs to exist with other games in the genre. It needs to... It's a staple in gaming. It's one of Xbox's biggest IPs. Now, I think it's kind of... You know, it's lost some of that prestige over the years because... Of, you know, with Halo 5 and then the years that have gone on where the esports scene has been, uh, I mean, it's been a joke at this point. I mean, and uh, it's really been unfortunate. Gears of War has kind of stepped it up somewhat, but uh, you, for Xbox at least, you need Gears and Halo. You need both of those up there. And now with Fable, that reboot coming, you got those big three exclusives for Xbox. It could be absolutely huge for Xbox moving forward. And so they really got to rally around those, those titles and kind of push us into this next generation of, of, of console um, and, and, and games as well. But what do you guys think? What do you think about Halo Infinite and everything that we know at this point in time? What are you guys most excited about? What are you guys skeptical about? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Halo Infinite content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. Enter the Matrix was one of those games, guys, that released, it feels like, so long ago, and uh, I really felt that this was a special title that I would obviously love to see a return to at some point or another, especially with the Matrix, uh, as far as a reboot coming out, as, as far as what we think, it's going to be a reboot from the standpoint of the movies, and... With that, guys, I wanted to talk about Enter the Matrix 2, uh, the game that we never got, that I was hoping that we would get. And I think that, typically speaking, guys, you can probably, uh, you know, 
expect that the the matrix from you know just the first movie um, all the way to now, this has been one of those movies that has been talked about. It's one of the cult classics at this point in time. And I know a lot of people didn't like The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. I actually liked The Matrix Reloaded. I didn't like a lot of the CGI used. Uh, I did not like The Matrix Revolutions. Uh, and The Matrix obviously stays as the best in the, in the, in the trilogy. Now, what we got to look at here is, you know how, you know, everything kind of went here with Enter the Matrix when this released. So you got to look at the timetable, who kind of created it. And then on top of that, you got to look at, you know, why didn't we get in Enter the Matrix 2 and where is it at this point in time? You got to have to kind of look at the past. Usually a couple of things dictate why or why not a franchise continues in one way, shape or form. And number one is usually the sales of a game. And number two is the reception that, you know, what people think overall about the title. So with that, guys, Enter the Matrix. This game, guys, released in North America May 14th of 2003, guys. 2003. Now, uh, Enter the Matrix is an action-adventure video game. This is coming to us from Wikipedia, guys. Developed by Shiny Entertainment and published by Infogrames. Released under the Atari brand name. It was the first game based on the Matrix series of films. Its story is concurrent with that of The Matrix Reloaded and features over an hour of original footage directed by the Wachowskis and starring the cast of the film trilogy produced for the game. So the Wachowskis guys are obviously the two who created the Matrix as a whole. They, they directed all three of the movies. They also did this one. They directed uh, the Enter the Matrix. While it was not critically well received, it sold 1 million copies in its first 18 days and released 2.5 million over the next over the first six weeks and ultimately 5 million copies. The success led to the game being re-released for multiple consoles budget brands with the PC version getting a DVD-ROM version. Re uh, obviously, guys, released in May of 20, uh, 2003, uh, the same month as The Matrix Reloaded, Enter the Matrix was simultaneously produced with The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions and released for the GameCube, Microsoft Windows, PlayStation 2, and Xbox. I played it on Xbox, guys, and I gotta tell you, I loved this game. This game was great, man. I mean, it was just a lot of fun. It was just kind of one of those games where you enjoyed, like, the story, obviously, but it was just so cool, like, you know, going into that slow-mo and, and running up walls and, and doing, you know, using your akimbo weapons and such. I mean, it was just so cool being able to, like, go and dive into that world. And at the time, guys, the graphics were pretty good. The characters, we I, I like the characters. Um, it was really neat, and I think that, yes, it came out around the exact same time as the, the Matrix Reloaded, so they were kind of cross-marketing, but think of it this way, guys. We haven't had a Matrix movie in quite some time. We're getting the Matrix. It is returning. Could we get the Enter, Enter the Matrix 2 uh, with that release of, of, of the upcoming next Matrix movie? That's something that we've got to uh, kind of think about here because there's a possibility, I think, that we could get Enter the Matrix 2 that comes out around the same time that the next Matrix reboot comes out uh, from, uh, from the Wachowskis. It should be interesting, guys. But like I said, it certainly was not... Uh, the, you know, the, the, the money that de decided what the fate of Enter the Matrix was because all in all guys, by February, 2004, the global sales of Enter the Matrix across all systems had surpassed 4 million units. According to Atari by July, 2006, the PlayStation 2 version of Enter the Matrix had sold 1.2 million copies and earned $58 million in the United States. Next Generation ranked it as the 39th highest selling game launch for the PlayStation 2, Xbox, or GameCube between January 2000 and July 2006 in that country. Combined sales of Enter the Matrix uh, console releases reached 1.9 million units in the United States by July 2006. Worldwide, the game sold 5 million units. So let's put this in perspective, guys. 5 million units it sold, okay, worldwide. And, and and remember the time that this came out, okay? I mean, we're talking, I mean, you're going way back to 2003. So it sold very well. 
But here's that second part that I was talking about was the reception. A lot of times the reception, guys, also dictates it. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about money. So uh, usually that will dictate things. But maybe they just didn't have a vision for Enter the Matrix 2 or, or another Matrix game. Who knows? But if we look at the reception, overall, guys, it was mixed or average at best. Um, and I thought that uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate because I thought it was pretty good. I mean, I thought that it wasn't the greatest game ever made, in my opinion but it was very fun for what it was, and um, I don't know, I just, I thought it was good, I mean, I, I like the game, and now it's been years since I played it, but, you know, kind of putting myself back then, from a graphics perspective, all the different gameplay mechanics that were in the game, I enjoyed it, but that's not so much what, uh, you know, Eurogamer, uh, or game game informer gave an 8.5 out of 10, which was, you know, that's, that's, I mean, you know, that's pretty good. But on the flip side of that, you've got, uh, you know, game rankings giving a 69%, Metacritic 65 or a 62, depending on which console you're looking at. You look at Entertainment Weekly, they gave it a B. That's pretty good. IGN 7.2 out of 10. That's pretty good. I mean, that that's not bad. Now, they're average, right? You know, mixed and averaged. Um, now, EGM gave it a 4.33 out of 10. Not so good. Eurogamer 4 out of 10. That's not very good either. So, like, like we were saying mixed reviews. Now, I would say that they're higher rather than lower, in my opinion, especially when you're looking at, like, Game Informer, even IGN, you look at Entertainment Weekly. Um, you know, it's a little bit above average, in my opinion. And so, when I look at that, you know, that may have very well have been the reason why they decided not to make another one. Uh, I, it's it's unfortunate. There was a lot of talk, though, that Enter the Matrix actually drew a lot of attention away from The Matrix Reloaded, which The Matrix Reloaded really, I mean, that was a, a high-grossing movie um, for the Wachowskis. And uh, obviously, it got a lot of backlash, though, because people did not like it nearly as much as the first Matrix. And who knows what's going to happen with this upcoming Matrix movie. I would say it's probably, you know, just knowing what we know at this point is how about the trilogy, the, you know, the Matrix reboot that comes out, it's probably not going to be as iconic as the first Matrix movie, but I would say that there's definitely with the technology we have now could be really special. Enter the Matrix 2 could be really special at this point in time with the gr added graphics, new gameplay, not new, but, you know, updated gameplay, updated mechanics, uh, other characters that you can play as, more ways you can kind of connect with these different characters. Imagine semi-open world setting, which would be really cool to be able to explore a little bit of, of this world. I don't know. I'm of the of the feeling that I would love to see a continuation of Enter the Matrix, guys. But I think when you ask where is it, I think that there's a possibility that we could get an Enter the Matrix 2 when this The Matrix reboot comes out from the Wachowskis. There's a possibility. I'm not going to say that it's definitely going to happen, guys. But I would say that if we're going to get a second Enter the Matrix or if it's call, called just The Matrix... If we get something like that, um, it would probably come out when this reboot comes out. And so uh, that's going to be really interesting, guys. But let me know, what do you guys think happened to Enter the Matrix? And where is Enter the Matrix 2 at this point? Do you think it's something that could happen in the foreseeable future? Or do you think there's no way? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Enter the Matrix 2 content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. And with that being said, everyone, I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of The 8 Below Show. And if you guys did, leave a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, stay positive, and as always, I'll talk to you guys all in the next one. Peace.